Chapter 14, how to get and keep that winning feeling. Slump, I ain't in no slump. I just ain't hitting. Yogi Berra. Your powerful servo mechanism is teleological. That is, it operates in terms of goals and end results. Once you give it a definite goal to achieve, you can depend on its automatic guidance system to take you to that goal much better than you ever could by conscious thought. You supply the goal by thinking in terms of end results. Your automatic mechanism then supplies the means whereby. If your muscles need to perform some motion to bring about the result, your automatic mechanism will guide them much more accurately and deliberately and delicately than you could by taking thought. If you need ideas, your automatic mechanism will supply them. There are even many who believe that if you need contacts, your servo mechanism will magnetically attract them. Whatever it, it, the extent of its powers, one thing is certain, it will lie sleepy, lazy, and dormant if undirected. Note the word servo it is your servant if not called on servants in the mansion polish the silver prepare high tea or launder the clothes solely on their own initiative attempting to anticipate the lord of the manor's wishes nope don't count on it also, if the servants employed speak only in an unintelligible foreign tongue and the master speaks only in English, unintelligible to the servant, how much will get accomplished then? You see, psycho cybernetics is both the language translator so that you master can communicate with and be understood by your inner servant so that the means of organizing the to-do list directives you give the inner servant uh, and they will may the means of organizing the to-do list directives you give to the inner servant so that they may be brought to fruition think in terms of possibilities you must supply the goal and to supply a goal capable of activating your creative mechanism you must think of the end result in terms of a present possibility the possibility of the goal must be seen so clearly that it becomes real to your brain and nervous system so real in fact that the same feelings are evoked as would be present if the goal were already achieved this is not as difficult or mystical as it may first appear. You and I do it every day of our lives. What, for example, is worry about possible unfavorable future results accompanied by feelings of anxiety, inadequacy, or perhaps humiliation? For all practical purposes, we experience the very same emotions in advance that would be appropriate if we had already failed. We picture failure to ourselves, not vaguely or in general terms, but vividly and in great detail. We repeat the failure images over and over again to ourselves. We go back in memory and dredge up memory images of past failures. Remember what has been emphasized earlier. Our brain and nervous system cannot tell the difference between a real experience and one that is vividly imagined. Our automatic creative mechanism always acts and reacts appropriately to the environment, circumstance, or situation. The only information concerning the environment, circumstance, or situation available to it is what you believe to be true concerning them. Your nervous system can't tell real failure from imagined failure. 
Thus, if we dwell on failure and continually picture failure to ourselves in such vivid detail that it becomes real to our nervous system, we will experience the feelings, even the physical responses that go with failure. On the other hand, if we keep our positive goal in mind and picture it to ourselves so vividly as to make it real and think of it in terms of an accomplished fact, we will also experience winning feelings, self-confidence, courage, and faith that the outcome will be desirable. We cannot consciously peek into our creative mechanism and see whether it is geared for success or failure, but we can determine its present set by our feelings. When it is set for success, we experience that winning feeling. Setting your machinery for success. And if there's one simple secret to the operation of your creative servo mechanism, it is this. Call up, capture, evoke the feeling of success. When you feel successful and self-confident, you will act successfully. When the feeling is strong, you can literally do no wrong. The winning feeling itself does not cause you to operate successfully, but it is more in the nature of a sign or symptom that we are geared for success. It is more like a thermostat, which does not cause the heat in the room, but measures it. However, we can use this thermostat in a very practical way. Remember, when you experience that winning feeling, your internal machinery is set for success. Too much effort to consciously bring about spontaneity is likely to destroy spontaneous action. It is much easier and more effective to simply define your goal or end result. Picture it to yourself clearly and vividly. Then simply capture the feeling you would experience if the desirable goal were already an accomplished fact. Then you are acting spontaneously and creatively. Then you are using the powers of your subconscious mind. Then your internal machinery is geared for success to guide you in making the correct muscular motions and adjustments to supply you with creative ideas and to do whatever else is necessary to make the goal an accomplished fact. How that winning feeling won a golf tournament. Dr. Kerry Middlecoff, writing in the April 1965 issue of Esquire magazine, said that the winning feeling is the real secret of championship golf. Four days before I hit my first drive in the Masters last year, I had a feeling I was sure to win that tournament. He said, I feel that every move I made in getting to the top of my backswing put my muscles in perfect position to hit the ball exactly as I wanted to. And in putting too, that marvelous feeling came to me. I knew I hadn't changed my grip any and my feet were in the unusual position, but there was something about the way I felt that gave me a line to the cup just as clearly as if I had been, it had been tattooed on my brain. With that feeling, all I had to do was swing the clubs and let nature take its course. Middlecoff went on to say that the winning feeling is everybody's secret of good golf. That when you have it, the ball even bounces right for you. And that it seems to control that elusive element called luck. Before pitching his perfect game in the World Series, Don Larson said that the night before, he had the crazy feeling that he would pitch perfectly the next day. Today's athletes sometimes talk about this winning feeling as being in the zone as entering a time and place and emotional state where they are totally relaxed, totally confident of the outcome. 
many times we can sense that they are in the zone just by observation. Recall John Elway's last minute end zone to end zone march that deprived the Cleveland Browns of competing in the Super Bowl, now known to football fans as the drive. Just about everybody who watched the drive looked at each other when it began and nodded. It seemed predestined and inevitable, even to the Browns, that the drive was about to occur. But let's remember that the zone is not a real physical place, nor is it a sudden change in physical skill or technical capability, nor is it even rationally justified by statistical probabilities or past experience. It is purely an emotional state. In my opinion, it is the complete and utter release of responsibility for hitting a target to the servo mechanism. It is, in a way, surrender to the servo mechanism to such a degree that all anxiety, worry, stress, and desperation disappear in an instant, and the person just goes about performing the necessary functions in a calm, business-like manner. Much work has gone into finding ways to trigger this emotional state on demand. The popular motivational guru of recent years, Tony Robbins, is reportedly paid huge sums by a handful of top athletes, notably inclu including Andre Agassi and Greg Norman, to teach them such get-into-state-fast techniques. There is truly magic in this winning feeling. It can seemingly cancel out obstacles and impossibilities. It can use errors and mistakes to accomplish success. J.C. Penney tells how he heard his father say on his deathbed, I know Jim will make it. From that time onward, Penny felt he would succeed somehow. Although he had no tangible assets, no money, no education, the chain of J.C. Penny stores was built on many impossible circumstances and discouraging moments. Whenever Penny would get discouraged, however, he would remember the prediction of his father, and he would feel that somehow he could whip the problem facing him. After making a fortune, he lost it all at an age when most men have long since retired. He found himself penniless, past his prime, and with little tangible evidence to furnish reason for hope. But again, he remembered the words of his father and soon recaptured the winning feeling which had now become habitual with him. He rebuilt his fortune, and in a few years, he was operating more stores than ever. Mr. Penny had his most concrete foundation, a profound fundamental belief groomed into his self-image that he was the kind of person who would make it. Unfortunately, many people have heard just the opposite from parents or other influences causing them to give far greater importance to the times when they fail than to the times they succeed, gradually becoming convinced that they are the kind of persons who never seem to make it happen. The simple distinction in self-concept and self-talk should not have its strength and power underestimated. How that winning feeling made Les Giblin successful. Les Giblin, founder of the famous Les Giblin Human Relations Clinics and author of the book, How to Have Power and Confidence in Dealing with People, read the first draft of this chapter, then told me how imagination coupled with that winning feeling had worked like magic in his own career. Les had been a successful salesperson and sales manager for years. He had done some public relations work and had gained some degree of reputation as an expert in the field of human relations. He liked his work, but he wanted to broaden his field. His big interest was people. 
and after years of study, both theoretical and practical, he thought he had some answers to the problems people often have with other people. He wanted to lecture on human relations. However, his one big obstacle was lack of experience in public speaking. Les told me, One night I was lying in bed thinking of my one big desire. The only experience I had as a public speaker was addressing small groups of my own salesmen in sales meetings and a little experience I had in the army when I served part-time as an instructor. The very thought of getting up before a big audience scared the wits out of me. I just couldn't imagine myself doing it successfully. Yet, I could talk with my own salesman with the greatest of ease. I had been able to talk to groups of soldiers without any trouble. Lying there in bed, I recaptured the memory of the feeling of success and confidence. I had had in talking to these small groups. I remembered all the little incidental details that had accompanied my feeling of poise. Then in my imagination, I pictured myself standing before a huge audience and making a talk on human relations. And at the same time, having the same feeling of poise and self-confidence. I had had with smaller groups. I pictured to myself in detail just how I would stand. I could feel the pressure of my feet on the floor. I could see the expression on people's faces. I could hear their applause. I saw myself making a talk successfully going over with a bang. Something seemed to click in my mind. I felt elated. Right at that moment, I felt I could do it. I wielded the feeling of confidence in the future. My feeling of success was so real that I knew right then and right then I could do it. I got what you call that winning feeling and it has never deserted me although there seemed to be no door open to me at the time and the dream seemed impossible in less than three years time I felt it because of the fact that I was relatively unknown and because of my lack of experience no major booking agency wanted me this didn't deter me I booked myself and still do. I have more opportunities for speaking engagements than I can feel. Les Giblin became known as an authority on human relations. Over 200 of the largest corporations in America have paid him thousands of dollars to conduct human relations clinics for their employees. His book, How to Have Confidence and Power, has become a classic in the field. And it all started with a picture in his imagination and that winning feeling. Les, Les's experience demonstrates how we must search out our past experiences for signs that the goal we are now tentatively imagining can be achieved. Those signs are almost always there or the goal would never have occurred to us in the first place. You undoubtedly have little past indications that you can do what it is you would most like to do and if you will look for them and highlight them in your mind you can begin proving to your self image that you are in fact qualified to be as you desire to be secure its acceptance of this as new truth and send your servo mechanism hurrying to make it so When you shine your spotlight on these can-do indicators and consign everything else to the shadows, your winning feeling will be reflected back and envelop you in its warmth. (laughs) 
two men, two different feelings. I once had occasion to observe two men I knew quite well. I had rem they had remarkably similar backgrounds, education, intelligence, and skill, both attempting to master a brand new endeavor at the same time. Each was totally unknown to the other, but both observed me. The details of the task being undertaken are unimportant. Suffice it to say, it represented considerable difficulty and offered up considerable frustration and required considerable patience. One of these men said to me, I'll never get this. You know, Max, all my life, everything's been difficult for me. I've had to do everything the hard way. I can't recall ever getting a break. I just don't have it in me to fight my way through this too. The other fellow said to me, Max, I'll tell you something. All my life, everything's been difficult for me. Every single thing I now do well. Every single thing I can now do effortlessly. And every success I've had, I started out doing it badly and struggled mightily to get from bad to good. If there's one thing I know exactly how to do, it is to go from being a bumbling incompetent to capable. Looks like I'm going to do that again with this. Which one of these men do you suppose gave up on his goal and walked away empty-handed and unfulfilled? Which do you suppose wound up successful? This is more than just the old cliche about positive thinking. Glass has full versus glass has empty. That's superficial and tends to be consciously forced. This is deeper, foundational, right there in the self-image. How these two men have interpreted their lives, how they feel about themselves. One will see the slightest improvement as encouraging proof that he is again progressing as usual from, from ineptness to competence, while the other will see the exact same slight improvement as proof that he is mired in struggle, so great in challenge, so unyielding, he is not up to the task. Any two people can look at any situation and interpret it quite differently. That's why we have conservatives and liberal, liberals and so on. There's room for differences of opinion about you too. If you hold an opinion about yourself that is limiting and inhibiting, try to step out and examine yourself as an outside analyst then advocate the opposing opinion. The most adept debaters can take either side of any argument and win. Try it. How science explains that winning feeling. The science of cybernetics throws new light on just how the winning feeling operates. We have previously shown how electronic servo mechanisms make use of stored data comparable to human memory to remember successful actions and repeat them. Skill learning is largely a matter of trial and error practice until a number hits or successful actions that have registered in memory. Cybernetic scientists have built what they call an electronic mouse, which can learn its way through a maze. The first time through, the mouse makes numerous errors. It constantly bumps into walls and obstructions. But each time it bumps into an obstruction, it turns 90 degrees and tries again. If it runs into another wall, it makes another turn and goes forward again. Eventually, after many, many errors, stops and turns, the mouse gets through the open space in the maze. The electronic mouse, however, remembers the successful turns and next time through, these successful motions are reproduced 
or played back and the mouse goes through the open space quickly and efficiently the object of practice is to make repeated trials constantly correct errors until a hit is scored when a successful pattern of action is performed the entire action pattern from beginning to end is not only stored in what we call conscious memory but in our very nerves and tissues folk language can be very intuitive and descriptive when we say I had a feeling in my bones that I could do it we are not far from right when Dr. Kerry Middlecoff says there was something about the way I felt that gave me a line to the cup just as clearly as if it had been tattooed on my brain he is perhaps unknowingly very aptly describing the latest scientific concept of just what happens in the human mind when we learn remember or imagine how your brain records success and failure much research in the workings of the brain has taken place since I wrote the original psycho cybernetics book but this explanation condensed from it remains helpful in understanding how the winning feeling or failure feeling comes about the human cortex is composed of billions of neurons each with numerous accents feelers or extension wires which form synapses electrical connections between the neurons when we think remember or imagine these neurons discharge an electrical current that can be measured when we learn something or experience something a pattern of neurons forming a chain or tattooing of a pattern is set up in the brain tissue this pattern is not in the nature of a physical groove like a groove in a record although that analogy is not far off the mark but more in the nature of an electrical track the arrangement and electrical connections between various neurons being somewhat similar to a magnetic pattern recorded on a CD the same neuron may thus be a part of any number of separate and distinct patterns making the human brain's capacity to learn and remember almost limitless these patterns or engrams are stored away in the brain tissue for future use and are reactivated or replayed whenever we remember a past experience in short there is a tattooing or action pattern of engrams in your brain for every successful action you have ever performed in the past and if you can somehow furnish the spark to bring that action pattern into life or replay it it will execute itself and all you have to do is quote swing the clubs and let nature take its course when you reactivate successful action patterns out of the past you also reactivate the winning feeling that accomplished them by the same token you can recapture that winning feeling you also evoke all the winning actions that accompanied it view this as a circular process feeling begets action action begets feeling or imagined action especially memory based imagined actions begets feeling feeling begets action fortunately it doesn't matter much where in that loop you strike the spark build success patterns into your gray matter when dr elliot president of harvard once made a speech on what he called the habit of success many failures in elementary schools he said were due to the fact that students were not given at the very beginning a sufficient amount of work which they could succeed and thus never had an opportunity to develop the atmosphere of success or what we call the winning feeling students he said who had never experienced success early in their school life 
had no chance to develop the habit of success. Many failures in elementary schools, he said, were due to the fact that students were not given at the very beginning a sufficient amount of work at which they could succeed and thus never had an opportunity to develop the atmosphere of success or what we call the winning feeling. Students, he said, who had never experienced success early in their school life had no chance to develop the habit of success, the habitual feeling of faith and confidence in undertaking new work. He urged that teachers arrange work in the early grades so as to ensure that students experience success. The work should be well within the ability of the student, yet interesting enough to arouse enthusiasm and motivation. These small successes, said Dr. Elliott, will give students the feeling of success, which would be a valuable ally in future undertakings. When a quarterback is injured and removed from the game, and the second stringer who has been warming the bench is rushed in, the astute coach tries to give him easy plays with a high probability of success. Even if small, in order to establish a sense of success, a rhythm, to spark that winning feeling. Rather than having him attempt to pass downfield or over the middle that might result in a gain of 10 or 20 or 30 yards, but may be difficult to complete, the play might be a little swing pass, almost sideways. That may result in a gain of only 2 or 3 yards, but has a very high probability of being successfully completed. A top salesman I know in the printing industry habitually arranges his schedule so that his first two sales calls of each day are in friendly territory. He visits clients where he knows he will be welcomed, where he writes business repetitively, where there is a high likelihood of being asked to bid a job or even immediately take an order, or at the very least, he'll be treated respectfully and courteously. Then he moves on to cold calling on possible new accounts where the welcome may not be nearly as warm or visiting the tough customers who are ultra price conscious where he is frequently outbid. He tells me he wants a winning feeling already in place before testing his patience and persistence. His sales manager says small victories lead to big victories. Fred DeLuca, the founder of Subway Sandwich Shop Chain, a champion of micro business launches, counsels, make pennies first. It's easy to envision making dollars if you've made pennies, easier to envision making thousands if you made hundreds. What you might call the small victory process is the natural evolution of things. Crawl, stand by holding on to something, stand independently toddle forward while holding on to something. Walk. Having mastered walking, it's a bit easier to believe you can ride a bicycle. Having ridden a bicycle, it's easier to picture yourself riding a motorcycle. We can acquire the habit of success or rhythm of success. We can build into our gray matter patterns or feelings of success at any time and at any age by following Dr. Elliott's advice to teachers. The savvy coach's strategy for the inexperienced quarterback, the printing sales rep's trick for starting each day. If we are habitually frustrated by failure, we are apt to acquire habitual feelings of failure which color all new undertakings. But by arranging things so that we can succeed in little things, we can build an atmosphere of success that will carry over into large undertakings. We can gradually undertake more difficult tasks and after succeeding in them, be in a position to undertake something even more challenging. Success is literally built on success and there is much truth in the saying, nothing succeeds like success. Obviously as adults we are eager to speed up this process to accelerate success, to have such a good foundation in place. We can even trigger our winning feeling on command. The experienced quarterback who has been parked on the bench for weeks needs and wants to turn on his winning feeling 
in an instant when suddenly needed in the game without requiring the gentle, patient buildup of small victories. This acceleration must be treated, must be created totally through imagination, not actuality. In the theater of the mind, rather than the arena of real experience, because synthetic and actual experience have virtually identical impact, this can be done. How to play back your own built-in success patterns. Everyone has at some time or another been successful in the past. It does not have to have been a big success. It might have been something as unimportant as standing up to the school bully and beating him, winning a race in grammar school, winning the sack race at the office picnic, winning out over a teenage rival for the affections of a girlfriend, or it might be the memory of a successful sale, your most successful business deal, or winning first prize for the best cake at the county fair. What you succeeded in is not so important as the feeling of success that attended it. All you need is an experience where you succeeded in doing what you wanted to and achieving what you set out to achieve and something that brought you some feeling of satisfaction. Go back in memory and relive those successful experiences. In your imagination, revive the entire picture in as much detail as you can. In your mind's eye, See not only the main event, but all the little incidental things that accompanied your success. What sounds were there? What about your environment? What else was happening around you at the time? What objects were present? What time of year was it? Were you cold or hot? And so forth. The more detailed you can make it, the better. And If you can remember in sufficient detail just what happened when you were successful at some time in the past, you will find yourself feeling just as you felt then. Try to particularly remember your feelings at the time. If you can remember your feelings from the past, they will be reactivated in the present. You will find yourself feeling self-confident because self-confidence is built on memories of past successes. Now, after arousing this general feeling of success, apply it in your thoughts to the important sale, conference, speech, business, golf tournament, rodeo competition, whatever you are engaged in now. Use your creative imagination to picture to yourself just how you would act and just how you would feel if you had already succeeded. Positive and constructive worry. Mentally, begin to play with the idea of complete and inevitable success. Don't force yourself. Don't attempt to coerce your mind. Don't try to use effort or willpower to bring about the desired conviction. Just do what you would do when you worry only worry about a positive goal and a desirable outcome rather than about a negative goal and an undesirable outcome don't begin to try to force yourself to have absolute faith faith in the desired success this is too big a bite for you to mentally digest at first use gradualness begin to think about the desired end result as you do when you worry about the future. When you worry, you do not attempt to convince yourself that the outcome will be undesirable. Instead, you begin gradually. You usually begin with suppose. Just suppose a such and such thing happens. You mentally say to yourself, you repeat this idea over and over to yourself. You play with it. Next comes the idea of possibility. Well, after all, you say, such a thing is possible. It could happen. Next comes mental imagery. You begin to picture to yourself all the various negative possibilities. You play these imaginative pictures over and over to yourself 
adding small details and refinements. As the pictures become more and more real to you, appropriate feelings begin to manifest themselves, just as the imagined outcome have already happened. And this is the way that fear and anxiety develop. How to cultivate faith and courage. Faith and courage are developed in exactly the same way, only your goals are different. If you are going to spend time and worry, why not worry constructively? Begin by outlining and defining to yourself the most desirable possible outcome. Begin with your suppose. Suppose the best possible outcome did actually come about. Next, remind yourself that after all, this could happen. Not that it will happen at this stage, but only that it could. Remind yourself that such a good, desirable outcome is possible. Mentally accept and digest these gradual doses of optimism and faith. After having the thought of the desired end result as a definite possibility, begin to imagine what the desirable outcome would be like. Go over these mental images and de delineate details and refinements. Play them over and over to yourself. As your mental images become more detailed, they are repeated over and over again, you will find they are more appropriate feelings and they are beginning to manifest themselves just as if the favorable outcome had already happened. This time the appropriate feelings will be those of faith, self-confidence, courage, or all of them wrapped up into one package, that winning feeling. Don't take counsel of your fears. General George Patton, the hell for leather, old blood and guts, general of World War II fame, was once asked if he ever experienced fear before battle. Yes, he said. He often experienced fear just before an important engagement and sometimes during a battle, but he added, I never take counsel of my fears. If you experience negative feelings, anxiety, fear, before an important undertaking, as everyone does from time to time, it should not be taken as a sure sign that you will fail. It all depends on how you react to them and what attitude you take toward them. If you listen to them, obey them, take counsel of them, you will probably perform badly. But this need not be true. First of all, it is important to understand that failure feelings, fear, anxiety, lack of self-confidence, do not spring from a heavenly oracle. They are not written in the stars. They are not holy gospel, nor are they intimations of a set and decided fate. That means that failure is decreed and decided. They originate from your own mind. They are indicative only of attitudes of mind within you, not of external facts that are rigged against you. They mean only that you are underestimating your own abilities, overestimating and exaggerating the nature of the difficulty before you, and that you are reactivating memories of past failures rather than memories of past successes. That is all that they mean and all that they signify. They do not pertain to or represent the truth concerning future events, but only your own mental attitude about the future event. Knowing this, you are free to accept or reject these negative failure feelings, to obey them, and take counsel of them or to ignore them and go ahead. Moreover, you are in a position to use them for your own benefit. Accept 
negative feelings as a challenge. If we react to negative feelings aggressively and positively, they become challenges that automatically arouse more power and more ability within us. The ideas of difficulty, threat, and menace arouse additional strength within us if we react to them aggressively rather than passively. In the last chapter, we saw that a certain amount of excitement, if interpreted correctly and employed correctly, helps rather than hinders performance. It all depends on the individual and his or her attitudes whether negative feelings are used as assets or liabilities. React aggressively to your own negative advice. Everyone has known individuals who can be discouraged and defeated by the advice from others that you can't do it. On the other hand, there are people who rise to the occasion and become more determined than ever to succeed when given the same advice. An associate of industrialist Henry Kaiser said, if you don't want Henry to do something, you would better not make the mistake of telling him he can't, it can't be done or that he can't do it, for he will then do it or bust. It is not only possible but entirely practical to react in the same aggressive, positive manner to the negative advice of our own feelings as we can and should when the negative advice comes from others. Overcome evil with good. Feelings cannot be directed, directly controlled by willpower. They cannot be voluntarily made to order or turned on and off like a faucet. If they cannot be commanded, however, they can be wooed. If they cannot be controlled by a direct act of will, they can be controlled indirectly. A bad feeling is not dispelled by conscious effort or willpower. It can be dispelled, however, by another feeling. If we cannot drive out a negative feeling by making a frontal assault on it, we can accomplish the same result by substituting a positive feeling. Remember that feeling follows imagery. Feeling coincides with and is appropriate to what our nervous system accepts as real truth about environment. Whenever we find ourselves experiencing undesirable feelings, we should not concentrate on the undesirable feeling even to the extent of driving it out. Instead, we should immediately concentrate on positive imagery, on filling the mind with wholesome, positive, desirable images, imaginations, and memories. If we do this, the negative feelings take care of themselves. They simply evaporate. We develop new feeling tones appropriate to the new imagery. If, on the other hand, we concentrate only on driving out or attacking worry thoughts, we necessarily must concentrate on negatives. And even if we are successful in driving out one worry thought, a new one or even several new ones are likely to rush in since the general mental atmosphere is still negative. Jesus warned us about sweeping the mind clean of one demon only to have seven new ones move in if we left the house empty. He also advised us not to resist evil, but to overcome evil with good. The Substitution Method of Curing Worry Dr. Matthew Chapel, a modern psychologist, recommends exactly the same thing in his book, How to Control Worry. We are worriers because we practice worrying until we become adept at it, says Dr. Chapel. We, we habitually indulge in negative imagery out of the past and in anticipating the future. This worry creates tension. The worrier then makes an effort to stop worrying and is caught in a vicious cycle. Effort increases tension. Tension provides a worrying atmosphere. 
And the only cure for worry, he says, is to make a habit out of immediately substituting pleasant, wholesome mental images for unpleasant worry images. Each time you find yourself worrying, use this as a signal to immediately fill the mind with pleasant mental pictures out of the past or in anticipating pleasant future experiences. And in time, worry will defeat itself because it has become a stimulus for practicing anti-worry. The warrior's job, says Dr. Chappelle, is not to overcome some particular source of worry, but to change mental habits. As long as the mind is set or geared in a passive, defeatist, I hope nothing happens sort of attitude, there will always be something to worry about. When I was a medical student, I remember being called on by the professor to orally answer questions on the subject of pathology. Somehow, I was filled with fear and anxiety when I stood up to face the other students and I couldn't answer the questions properly. Yet, on other occasions, when I looked into the microscope at a slide, and answered the typewritten questions before me, I was a different person. I was relaxed, confident, and sure of myself because I knew my subject. I had that winning feeling and did very well. As the semester progressed, I took stock of myself, and when I stood up to answer questions, I pretended I didn't see an audience, but was looking through a microscope. I was relaxed and substituted that winning feeling for the negative feeling of being quizzed orally. At the end of the semester, I did very well in both oral and written examinations. The negative feeling that had finally become a sort of bell that created a conditioned reflex to arouse that winning feeling. Today, I lecture and speak with ease at any gathering in any part of the world because I am relaxed and I know what I'm talking about when I do speak. More than that, I bring others into the conversation and make them feel relaxed too. The choice is up to you. Within you is a vast mental storehouse of past experiences and feelings, both successes and failures, like inactive recordings on tape, these experiences and feelings are recorded on the neural engrams of your gray matter. There are recordings of stories with happy endings and recordings of stories with unhappy endings. One is as true as the other. One is as real as the other. The choice is up to you as to which you select for playback. Another interesting scientific finding about these engrams is that they can be changed or modified. Somewhat as a tape recording may be changed by dubbing in additional material or by replacing an old recording with a new one. These recordings in the human brain tend to change slightly each time they are played back. They take on some of the tone and temper of our present mood, thinking and attitudes toward them. We now know that not only does the past influence the present, but that the present clearly influences the past. In other words, we are neither doomed nor damned by the past. Our present thinking, our present mental habits, our attitudes towards past experiences, and our attitudes toward the future all have an influence on old recordings. The old can be changed, modified, replaced by our present thinking. Old recordings can be changed. 
Another interesting finding is that the more a given recording or engram is activated or replayed, the more potent it becomes. The permanence of engrams is derived from synaptic efficacy, the efficiency and ease of connections between the individual neurons that make up the chain. And further, that synaptic efficiency improves with use and diminishes with disuse. Here again we have good scientific ground for forgetting and ignoring those unhappy experiences from the past and concentrating on the happy and pleasant. In doing so we strengthen those engrams having to do with success and happiness and weaken those having to do with failure and unhappiness. How we manufacture feelings or state. When a family member or friend dies, we recall many past experiences involving this person. We tend to set aside most of the bad memories and only recall but improve on and magnify the good ones. An uncle who was often sullen and distant and hypercritical but occasionally warm and witty is transformed into the life of the party and a great encourager who will be sadly missed at every future family occasion. A sister you were quite content to see only two or three times a year at, on holidays and never missed or thought of much in between is now a confidant you'll miss talking to every day. This is all part of the morning the morning feeling it is manufactured by choosing to replay only certain recordings to completely forget about others and even to modify the recordings played history is literally rewritten to permit the morning feeling we believe to be appropriate based on everything programmed into our own self-image about the kind of person we are and how we should behave in these circumstances. I remember attending a funeral where the brother of the deceased who had been estranged from his brother for years following a, a very bitter war over the family business stood up and spoke for nearly 15 minutes delivering an emotionally moving eulogy that had the halo glowing brightly over the coffin and left no dry eyes in the house. A few weeks later I encountered him in a neighborhood coffee shop and we sat down together to talk. I gingerly said, Bill, I know all about the bad feelings between you and your brother and I wonder how did you find it in you to be so gracious at his memorial ceremony? His answer reveals the chief secret to how we manufacture our feelings. He answered, I'm the kind of person who never speaks ill of the dead. The phrase, I'm the kind of person who, fill in the blank, is incredibly revealing and incredibly powerful. It reveals what is at the core, not the circumference of the self-image, to which all other thought, feeling, action, and outcome most conform. It also reveals exactly how you can lock in and assure the emergence of a winning feeling whenever it is appropriate. Mental training exercise. Change negative self-talk. The voice of the automatic failure mechanism to a positive affirmation. I am the kind of person who. Repeat the affirmation as a, po as a personal ma mantra until it becomes an automatic response to any sliver of self-doubt that slips through the door. Here are a few examples. I'm the kind of person who effectively plans the day ahead, sets goals, and accomplishes them. I'm the kind of person who listens carefully, then communicates confidently and persuasively. I'm the kind of person who takes the initiative in solving problems and suggests ideas. I'm the kind of person who stays calm under pressure. I'm the kind of person who prefers fresh fruit and other healthy foods to junk food. 